Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. My name is Jesse Day, and before we get started, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is a renowned analyst in the precious metals space, the author of The Silver Manifesto, and the publisher of The Morgan Report. Here to talk silver, so very excited about that. Mr. David Morgan, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Jesse. I want to get started with the price action that we've seen in silver since it rose sharply in 2020, um, and it's been moving sideways for the most part. And there's been debate as to whether silver will play a more industrial role or a more monetary role up ahead and how that could impact the price action. So with all that in mind, what do you think the catalysts could be for a move higher in silver up ahead? All right, there's a bit to unpack there. First of all, silver at the present time, according to the Silver Institute, is 55% in industrial metal. And if you go back two decades, it was 35%. So it's increased significantly over the last two decades. However, it's also a monetary metal and has been. In fact, the United States was founded on a silver standard, not a gold standard. And that was changed in 1873, when what's called the crime of 1873, when the Eastern bankers basically went put it, put the U.S. on a gold standard. So where we go in the future is uh, <clears throat> dependent upon a catalyst. And what is that catalyst? The catalyst will be monetary driven. Uh, the reason being is that there's pretty much a steady offtake in the industrial side. So that doesn't vary very much over time. And it increases, as I said. But what the variable is investment demand. And investment demand ebbs and flows. And I know you have some other questions because you sent them to me ahead of time. So I won't answer it ahead of time. But uh, all markets move at the margin. So what's the, the biggest variable? It's really not silver jewelry. It's really not silverware. It's investment demand. People that say, oh, I need to buy silver. It's a safe haven or it's too low in price. It's going to go higher. Or, you know, I found out about the solar panels increasing, probably doubling within the next few years and anything that, you know, causes them to take action. So speaking of silver for industrial use, what do you make of the evidence that's being presented? I've spoken to Peter Kraut. I've spoken to Chen Lin. Some other people are pointing to this as well, and that is silver's growing use in solar panel construction. Do you think that's something to take into account when looking at the overall picture for silver? And do you think it could have a meaningful impact on demand? Absolutely. It's about 10% of the market now, and it'll probably double before 2030. And... Uh... I think it's in a later question, but I'll answer it now. There is the new solar panels actually use more silver per panel than less. And for the last two decades, they've been what's called thrifting, using less and less silver per panel to get the same amount of kilowatts of output. But what they've discovered is with putting more silver in, they can like really increase the output. So it's, it's more efficient. It's better, you know, bang for the buck. So the new panels are going to take about 80% of the market. So a lot of people think, well, you know, the old style will be predominantly the new, the market going forward. And that is not true. The ones that use the more, most silver will be the predominant uh, solar panels moving forward. And I want to talk about the gold silver ratio because the current gold silver ratio is at about 83 to one, meaning it takes approximately 83 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. This is in stark contrast to the amount of silver actual, compared to gold in the Earth's crust, which is estimated around 16 to one. So do you think we could see that gap get closer to its real ratio in terms of the price? Um, will it eventually correct to the actual supply of silver versus gold? Could it land somewhere in the middle? What are your thoughts there? Well, first of all, the natural ratio, what's coming out of the Earth is actually eight to one. The 16 to one is, it's often talked about all over the internet. It's kind of a pet peeve of mine because that's the monetary ratio. That's what uh, <clears throat> you know. Some men decided was the correct ratio monetarily: sixteen ounces of silver bought one ounce of gold. So I think it, it it's something to consider. But if you consider it in the same light as say platinum, platinum is fifteen times rarer than gold. So why isn't platinum fifteen times the price of gold? It's not. So the market has a way of determining the price. Now, I believe the price of silver, gold, platinum, palladium is inaccurate for a lot of reasons. I think the price of oil is inaccurate. I think a lot of prices are inaccurate because we really don't have a free market mechanism to determine price anymore. We determine the price on a derivative. 
and a derivative gets called out occasionally for the actual product. <clears throat> Excuse me. But regardless of that, uh, I do think it favors this gold silver ratio. I wrote a, one of my first articles called Engineering the Price of Gold. And I went in and explained exactly how you determine the paper price of gold. It's a it's an arithmetic problem. A three third grader can do it. And at that time in 2000, the actual paper price of gold was 2,500 an ounce. Today, using that exact same equation where you look at M0, true money supply, and the gold supply purportedly held by the treasury, 265 million ounces, you do that division, comes out over $15,000. So that's the amount of M0 base money supply that's been put in the system for the last two decades. So in that paper, I said, I think, so now I've given you the price of gold, easy to determine the theoretical paper price. What about silver? More difficult. So I go through what you just said, Jesse. And that is 16 to 1. <coughs> Excuse me. 16 to 1 is the monetary ratio. And I think we'll get there. I also said in that paper that in an extreme case, it tends to overshoot. And we might see a 10 to 1 ratio, uh, <coughs> again, which is pretty close to what the the natural ratio coming out of the ground is, but no one knows. I fully expect silver to outperform. It's done that historically. It's a smaller market. It's got more upside. Even the mainstream press is talking about $30 silver and it's going to be in deficit for years. There's people that say it's not in deficit, but we could talk about that later on in this interview. So you also posted on Twitter recently that you're thinking a broad market crash could occur in October. And you said, quote, a big sell-off will take down all assets, including gold. As in 2008, gold will lose the least and rally first. So could you break that down for us? And also, do you expect silver to perform in the same way as gold in that scenario? Yes, I do. And breaking it down, I don't remember the, the numbers, but I remember the percentages. I remember for silver. So silver is at 21. And during the crash, it went really below nine. And gold went from where it was down about 30%. <clears throat> Both of the metals rallied rather quickly. In silver's case, it went from, I'll call it $9 to roughly 50. So <clears throat> over 500%. And gold, I, if I remember correctly, was about a double. I'd have to look. So silver definitely outperformed gold. That was the second leg up in the silver market, and that was a five-fold increase. Usually the third leg up, which we're coming into once gold breaks above the 2060 level and stays there, usually the third leg up is twice as good as the, as the middle leg or the second leg. So if you get a five-fold increase in the price of silver in the middle leg, theoretically, historically, it'll be tenfold. So if we go from the bottom, we'll call it the bottom of the illness in March 2020, it's hit, I think, 12. And you multiply that by 10, you're looking at 120. If you look at that as an anomaly, <clears throat> and silver was more around the $15, $18 range, and you do a factor of 10, you're looking at $180 silver. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to do that. All I'm doing is giving you probabilities, high probabilities. I'm not one of these people that think gold's going to 50000 it's going to cover all the outstanding credit because silver and gold are actually physical assets that, that reflect the base money supply or the kind of money you fold in your pocket or M1, that type of thing. Others disagree. I, that's my take, I, you know, and I'm not, I'm not budging. I mean, if I was given different, someone could convince me I've changed my mind, but no one can or has so far. So it's an element that's used as money and there's only so much of it, which makes it scarce, makes it precious and makes it valuable. I'd like to bring up another tweet here. And this one was from Chris Marcus of Arcadia Economics, which you also shared. And uh, he says, in case you missed it, the big news in the silver space was that there was a lot of bank short covering, which has left them net long. Traditionally, a good sign that the brunt of the sell-off has been completed. Could you walk us through what this means and why this is a good sign for the silver space? Certainly. Uh, kudos, a shout out to Ted Butler. I mean, Ted has been the forerunner and consistent on probably the premier uh, analyst that's talked about the commitment of traders. Early on, um, I called Ted a few times and he graciously gave me his time and actually taught me over the phone how to break down the commitment of traders report. So I got a pretty good handle on it. I've watched it. Not as avidly as I used to. There's more in the silver market than just the derivatives market, although that does set the price. So obviously it's very important. 
the point that's being made by Chris and others is that normally the commercials, which is basically the banks, it's really not too many companies that, that are primary silver producers that head silver. They know their shareholders are silver nuts and that they wouldn't want them to hedge. But who does hedge are your conglomerates, your RTZs, your BHPs, your multinational, multi-billion dollar mining concerns that mine every element on the planet. And they're huge. Silver is a very small portion of their bottom line. And they do hedge. In fact, they basically don't care about silver in most cases. So there is that. And that information is given to the bullion bankers that basically keep shorting the market because one, it maintains a certain price level. And secondly, they have the most information. They know how much is being produced at any given time. So they know when the supply will change up or down and, and act accordingly. So the point is that, yeah, it's very rare for the banks to go long. Very rare. And they are. And this is a, a you know, wake up call. Does it, is it really significant? It remains to be determined. I think it will be significant in the longer run. It might be significant immediately. I'm not going to get all excited. I've been in this market way too long. I've seen things that got me very excited and then turn into, you know, nothing burgers. And so this, you know, <clears throat> gray haired old man is going to just kind of wait and see, but it is a positive. There's no doubt about that. Is it an extreme positive? I don't know. You know, there's a lot of derivatives on the over the counter market that probably dwarfs what we see. And no one ever talks about this. So JP Morgan is short, short, short. Well, in the, in the market that we can look at, which Ted analyzes almost obsessively, that's true. I won't argue a fact. However, what we don't know is in the over the counter derivative market, they may be net long. They may have wiped out every uh, short position they have on the COMEX with a long position somewhere else. And the other part is the LBMA. It's not as transparent as the COMEX. We really don't know how many times that silver has been hypothecated and rehypothecated, put up for collateral, got a loan against it, swap against someone else. It's a leverage against the gold silver ratio. I mean, there's a lot of games that go on in all markets and particularly in the precious metals. Well, we were talking about supply earlier, and I want to read a quote from the Australia and New Zealand banking group and get your thoughts. They stated, growth in mine production is largely beholden to other metals projects for which silver is a byproduct. Above ground inventories remain plentiful, but have dropped sharply over the past couple of years. We estimate the silver market is entering a period of tightness unseen for decades. This may not be alleviated by higher silver prices. So do you concur with their view there? Is there anything you'd like to add to that statement? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I do concur. Uh, and I was early. I mean, I did a brand new analysis in, in 2000, in 2010. And I said, I thought the next decade, 2010 to 2020, would be as good as the first decade from 2000 to 2010. And I was wrong. I'll say it right to the camera. I was wrong. What I anticipated was, pretty much flat mining curve, which is wrong. Uh, we really increased the mining production of silver from 2006 onward until the last, well, I have to look five, six years from memory. I've got the, I'm putting the graph in my head. But the amount of silver, as we've talked about going into solar, and the amount of investment demand will continue. So a couple of points. One was they talked about, you know, plentiful supplies above ground, although it's been dwindling. From two, so there was a deficit from 1990 to 2005. For 15 years, we roughly took off, on average, 100 million ounces of silver. So we depleted the up, up above ground stockpile from 2 billion ounces to 500 million. We lost 1.5 billion ounces in 15 years. Since 2006 till now, we've actually rebuilt the above ground inventory to probably over 2 billion ounces. And I'm talking about investment grade silver, silver and commercial bars. 100 ounce bars and coins. So that would imply, well, how can there be a deficit <clears throat> if there's that much silver above ground? And the answer is a lot of that silver is held by investors that don't, won't sell it at these prices. And industry keeps, you know, using more and more as we talked about earlier. So it's as if you just locked it away and it's unavailable, at least unavailable at these prices. So that in my term, could be considered a deficit. Some say you know, not. I just want to be very clear for you know this interview and all interviews exactly what's taking place uh, for decades to come. Was that what it said? I forget. Can you re 
read the quote, how long it will last. Yeah, it said, um, it's entering a period of tightness unseen for decades that may not be alleviated by higher silver prices. Yeah, unseen for decades. So I just did that for you. I gave you the, the, the decade and a half that it was in that condition. And we are getting to a point, theoretically, I think it's about, um, oh, it's 2025, 2026, where we'll be in that type of a situation. Uh, <clears throat> so... I think that uh, silver is probably the legacy investment of the next decade or two. I mean, if you're 30, 40, 50 years old and you want to leave a legacy for your family, certainly everyone should own some gold. But if you really want to hit a home run and you're patient, I would suggest, you know, you put away some physical silver and store it either where you're comfortable with it or a storage facility that uh, you can verify is on the up and up. I want to come back, if I could, to the industrial demand and the uh, investment demand. So if we go back to 2020, and I think that's when we got that pretty big surge, what happened that year was mo very few people actually know. And that is in 2020, investment demand for silver was 320 million ounces from institutions and 200 million ounces from the retail investor for a total of around 520 million ounces. That's better than half the total silver supply. Total silver supply is about 850 for mining and 150 from recycling for a round number of 1 billion. So 520 is better than 50% of the total recycled and mined silver in one year. It's a phenomenal amount of demand. Since then, the institutions have backed off considerably. In fact, they're really not participating in this rally or, or this sideways movement that we're seeing currently. And that's the swing factor. It's always investment demand that's going to take it because, again, industrial demand is pretty much a constant. So what's the variable? The variable is if silver is a popular investment or is it not? And it's the investment demand. So I like to point out that there's about five, and I got this from Tavi Costa <clears throat> that did an interview that uh, I participated in or a presentation, I should say. He uh, told us that there's $5 trillion sitting on the sideline maybe more than that now. So 1% of that's 50 billion ounces, 1%. And 1% of that sitting on the sidelines money is equal to two complete years of silver production and recycling. So if you don't think in the next financial panic that at least 1% will find its way in the silver market, then, then go ahead, you know, challenge me. I may be right, I may be wrong, but I think you'll see at least 1%, if not something closer to five, maybe even 10 in a real panic. And there's just not that, there's that much paper money, but there's not that much silver. And so I really do expect what I've said for so many years, and that is the third leg up, the manic panic phase, which we have actually started in gold, but it hasn't been to the manic part yet. It's just basically uh, gathering steam, you know, the, the run to gold to start with a, you know, a small walk and the banks are taking up, smart money's moving into gold. That's obvious. Silver, they're waiting. Maybe um, they're networking, you know. Hey, don't don't promote silver and don't buy it, you know, because, again, <clears throat> this would be a time. But coming full circle, we have an indicator now that the banks are net long. So wait a minute. Well, the banks have gone net long gold um, much greater quantities in, in a long, long time, the last few years, couple of years. And now maybe they're moving into silver, at least temporarily. So. I am quite bullish, but the demand side that pushed the silver price up in 2020 was investment demand. And again, that's what will take place. I think there could be a time where it's difficult to source silver at the retail level. We've already seen that previously, maybe even at the wholesale level, especially if the institutions come in. Because institution buy, buys thousand ounce bars like investors buy 10 ounce bars or 100 ounce bars. So if that were the case, you would see competition between industry needing silver to stay in business and investors needing silver because the money system is collapsing or they fear that it's collapsing. So that would feed on each other. So you'd have kind of a shark feeding frenzy going on because silver has those assets that has those attributes of being both industrial and monetary. Well, let's shift to gold and silver miners now. Um, and get your thoughts there. When it comes to gold specifically, there's a big divergence between the gold price, which is pretty close to all-time highs, and 
the gold miners, if we look at the GDX, it's quite a ways off from its all-time high. Do you see any opportunity there? And if so, would you lean more towards larger producers, developers, or explorers? Yeah, I, first of all, I think it's an opportunity of a lifetime. To put it in uh, in context, you need a good job just to reemphasize. There's never been a bigger delta or change between the price of the metal and the price of the miners. In other words, the miners give you leverage to the metal. You know, do you want to buy the the golden egg or do you want to buy the goose that lays the golden egg? If you buy the goose that lays the golden egg, you got a cash flow in gold. And that's what happens, particularly in the in the royalty companies and the streamers. And that's what I've emphasized. The Morgan Report was started by me almost 25 years ago. And I got burned by buying the juniors. And I realized that big money goes into big companies. And that's what I've taught from the beginning. I do mid-tier companies. We do. We have. We used to have three sections: top tier, mid-tier, and speculations. Broke it down into four now. I've got top tier, mid-tier, junior producers, and speculations. And you want to be sprinkled through the sectors, but you want big money in big companies, mid money in mid companies, maybe easy money into the junior producers, and money you can afford to lose in the speculations, no matter how great the story or who's who's behind it. And certainly I've had great success in the early days from 2000 to 2010. I probably had more. I did. I had more speculations that became mine than anybody else in the business that I know of. <clears throat> but uh, my track record has not been that stellar in the last 10. Picking junior companies is extremely difficult. And that's why I only add to the companies on the way up, not on the way down. So with a few exceptions. So I really think that once you have your nest egg, the right amount, 5%, 10%, whatever it is in the physical, that you really want to carefully look. The top tier companies, if things go as I've outlined this whole interview, where we get in this panic manic mode where people are racing to the metals, then you will see the big companies look like junior miners because of the you know 5 trillion versus that small amount of mining entities. So even the you know Pan Americans and the Silver or the wheat and precious metals and the Heclas and the, uh, you know, RTZs even, you're going to see so much money come into them. It'll be flabbergasting. Got to remember, silver has a history of being very volatile and doing absolutely nothing for long periods of time and wearing you out, getting uh, silver or getting investors disinterested. Oh, it's never going anywhere. It's been flat for years. Why would you buy silver? And then all of a sudden it takes off in uh, 19. Um, 1980, Hecla Mines went from $5 to $50 in one year. It was the best performing stock on the entire New York Stock Exchange. It was sort of the Bitcoin of its day. And I think those days are coming back uh, briefly. I don't expect, I expect to see a very large parabolic move probably within the next two or three years. Some people say it's take as long as 10. I doubt it because industry alone is taking it you know, what we talked about to more and more scarcity uh, and able to obtain it. So I really, uh, and it is, you know, I'm biased because the Morgan Report focuses primarily on the equity side. <clears throat> Although I did catch the big move from that 2008 bottom, it um, it started to uh, base on a sideways formation, the easiest one to trade, called a channel formation. If it goes above the channel, you go long. If it goes below the channel, you go short. It went, it was a $19. I got in at 19. It went to 26. I exited. Two days later, I got back in because the Fed announced QE2. I knew that was perceived to be highly inflationary. So I, I got in and out where I got at 26. I had very little slippage. And I wrote it all the way up to 48. People that followed me into that trade, and I don't know how many did, you know, but I did get some letters, some emails, people that retired. They made so much money on that leverage move that they were able to retire early or cash it in or quit their job or whatever. Will that availability come again? I think it will. But of course, I'm not advocating futures trading for anybody. You about 99% lose money. You really have to know what you're doing. But uh, but it just proves the point that, you know, silver can be dull, 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 wear you out and I don't like it. Why do they ever get into it? And all of a sudden, it makes this move and you're left on the sidelines. Oh, man, why didn't I buy it? Oh, shoot. (laughs) So anyway, back to you. 
Well, I want to talk about, I want to end on this, uh, because this month we had a very special anniversary that uh, is actually kind of a sad anniversary, and that was the anniversary of Richard Tricky Dick Nixon removing gold from backing the U.S. dollar. So let's uh, take a walk down memory lane. If you could tell us, in your view, what were the implications of that, and are we still experiencing the aftershocks of that event today? Well, we are experiencing the after effects of that event. And to me, I'll just, you know, go to my mission statement. And that's to teach and empower people to understand the benefits of an honest financial system. Or you could say honest monetary system. So we're on one at Bretton Woods and the U.S. adhered to it until August 15, 1971. It wasn't gold's fault. You know, a lot of people say, oh, gold standard never look, works. Look at all the times it's failed. Gold doesn't fail. It's an element on the periodic chart for crying out loud. And it's been coveted by mankind in all jurisdictions or all places on the planet as the most voted for real money. So that's irrefutable. The problem was that the U.S. was not being honest. They were printing more pieces of paper or more receipts for gold than there was gold in the vault. So you're printing more receipts for gold than there's gold in the vault. Something's got to give. And the French and the and U.K., the United Kingdom, both are calling a bluff the United States. It's like a card game. All right, call. Here's here. I'll show you my cards. Give me the gold. And that started to drain the gold pool. And Nixon really didn't have any choice. Now, he could have been honest and said, you know, what I just told you. Of course, no politician's going to do that. So he had to come up with some excuse. And that was, it doesn't matter because it's still based on the full faith and credit of the United States, which means it's based on the full credit of the United States, which means the ability to tax the taxpayer and pay off the debt that's owed in the bond market. And of course, that's impossible now. And we all know that's why we are going to have a financial collapse in one shape or form. And it's getting closer by the day. So the repercussions are um, ongoing. Does the gold standard uh, fix all problems? No. Uh, An honest system would fix all problems, or I should say all, but would certainly mitigate all the issues we have now. And it could be done in a paper market. I don't like to say that because gold's a policeman on the currency and it works for, you know, periods of time until it doesn't, as we just outlined. But uh, in theory, if you had a receipt for all goods and services and no more than that, then you would have pretty much a sound system on paper. Of course, those don't work either, but there isn't a perfect system. But the sound money, especially a bimetallic system, where gold is really a stepping stone to fiat. Uh, There's an article written by a gentleman on um, Gold Eagle saying, uh, gold standards equals fiat in disguise. And when I saw that title, I had to read it. I thought, what's he talking about? You know, because the gold gold standard, gold standard, really a bimetallic or trimetallic standard is far superior. And that's proven out through monetary history. So really, that's why I've been such an advocate to put silver back into the monetary world which is being done, not so much of silver stackers because they tend to hoard, they don't tend to spend it. But in the digital world where you can put it on your phone and spend it, just like you do with Apple Pay, that's where I think we're going to get more traction in the silver market as a monetary asset. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us today. It was awesome chatting silver with you. For those who want to learn more, could you tell us about the Morgan Report, what it's all about and where people could find it? Yes, uh, the main site is themorganreport.com. I'm primarily an educator. You know, I've written three books. I'm in uh, the beginning of making a documentary. It's not primarily about silver. It's primarily about the problem of unsound monetary practices and what the solutions are. It'll be similar to the Four Horsemen film. There'll be a nar- narration underneath through the whole film. But we'll be interviewing a lot of people. Not necessarily, I want to get away from the echo chamber. I don't want to have just hard money people talking, although I do have uh, G. Andrew Griffin. That's our first uh, interview that we've captured already. But I want to look out broader, like um, uh, spirituality, food, you know, food, maybe organic farming is a solution, education, why this indoctrination system isn't working, and real free market education where people are taught how to think critically, and on and on it goes. So it's a kind of a passion. I decided not to write another book, Jesse, because... It just seems that uh, most people don't read as much as, you know, as old schools types do or did. And uh, everyone seems to like a video. And so I decided to put my last, you know, big effort 
in education and my passion into a film. So that's probably a year away. Don't get all excited. It's coming. It's called, working title is called Silver Sunrise. Kind of like, you know, coming up on a new day and maybe a brighter one for everyone. Uh, the Morning Report is a free publication on the website. And then there's a paid service. There's a couple levels of paid service. I have a premium service where I put out a monthly uh, electronic form uh, report. And then in between the time I publish till the next publication, I do uh, updates by video. So sometimes I look at the bond market. Sometimes I take questions from uh, members. Sometimes I look at the gold market, silver market, uh, you know, whatever's pertinent in the financial realm that bears upon investors. And then there is a mastermind series that's geared primarily for accredited investors or fund managers. And that is uh, monthly. Um, video that's captured and transcribed because they have people around the world. Some are not real, are primary English speakers. So we translate it and, or transcribe it, I should say. Or And then we do some uh, private placements on there uh, from time to time. It's not the main theme of it, but it does happen. In fact, I've had a couple or three this year, which is more than usual. It's about two a year. One's a copper situation that's pretty mammoth. And then I have one that's uh, in the Silver Valley, which I'm about an hour and a half from. That's uh, silver. But it's not a real high-grade silver. So if you're looking for high-grade, it's not. It's lead, zinc, and silver. But they also have a very big prospect in Mexico for lithium. So it's kind of an exciting speculation. So it's one of those bet a little to win a lot situations. So I've got uh, plenty of keeping me busy. And I always enjoy interviewing with you. And uh, hopefully I made. Uh, some comments that people will be able to get a better grasp of what the potential in the silver market is. Yes, you absolutely did. Thank you once again for joining us. I'll put a link to the Morgan Report down below for people who want to check it out. This documentary sounds very exciting, so I'm also eagerly awaiting that and uh, hope to chat again soon and, and talk silver again. Thank you, Jesse. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.